have him here and uh, his wife, uh, Mary, uh, uh, who's a native of Benton. So we're glad to have her and her sisters are here too. So we're glad to have them. And uh, Mr. Tom Dillard is our guest. And uh, uh, Tom is well known all over the state as the authority on Arkansas history. Maybe you read his uh, newspaper column uh, in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette each Sunday. And uh, he uh, began his uh, special collections head at the Torrenson Library at the University of Central Arkansas in Conway. Uh, he next became the head of the Butler Center at the Central Arkansas Library where he uh, founded the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. And if you've ever used that, that's a great source on Arkansas history. We're very indebted to him for that. And then he was at the uh, uh, Mullins Library as head of special collections at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, where he retired in 2012. And uh, he's now the kind of the sage of Arkansas history, <laughs> living in uh, uh, Hot Spring County. And so we're very looking forward to uh, his program tonight. So let's give him a good Saline County welcome, Mr. Tom Bill. Thanks, Steve. Um, can you hear me, Mary? Can you hear me all right? Are you all ears, Mary? Uh, he pointed out that Mary, my wife, uh, is the former Mary Frost from Benton. Uh, many of you will probably uh, would have known her parents probably and her two sisters here, who are here. Um, but actually Mary was born in Malvern. So the folks down there, we live in Hot Spring County now, uh, they claim her and when she's up here, at least some of the people in Benton uh, <laughs> claim her. I claim her all the time, by the way. Um, if you would, uh, turn your phones off put them on mute that is basically I'm going to tonight share with you some of the experiences that I have had through the years with um, collecting and uh, information on our state documenting the state of Arkansas um, and, and when I was in the seventh grade I uh, took a course in Arkansas history and um, junior high school, and that was a very important course for me. Um, for one thing, I discovered what history was, that history is not just something that happened at Valley Forge or at, uh, in great centers in the East, but it also plays out, American history plays out in every town, village, and family, of course, in the nation. But we grow up not knowing that, not having that connection to our own locale. Well, in the seventh grade, I was assigned to do, uh, we all had to do a project, and I was assigned Izzard County. And I really jumped into Izzard County, and it was really an interesting experience for me, and I came away from that knowing a whole lot more about Arkansas history and about the Ozarks and about uh, the geography of our state and so on. So as time went by, in college, I was going to be a, a political science major. Uh, but I, I, got, I got more and more interested in history as time went by, so I, uh, I got a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Central Arkansas in Conway. And while there, I had the opportunity to study under a, a professor named uh, Waddy Moore. And Dr. Moore was really interested in Arkansas history, and he shared that enthusiasm and interest with his students. And so I came out of UCA in 1970 with a burning desire to try to, try to be a historian. Uh, while I was in graduate school at Fayetteville working on my master's degree and still ho hoping to be a historian, uh, Jim Croce, the singer from that era in the early 1970s, Jim Croce had a song called uh, Working at the Lowdown Mind Messing Car Wash. That's, that's almost the title. In other words, somebody who trained to be something but ended up working in a car wash. Uh, working at the car wash blues. Working at the low-down, mind-messing car wash blues. That's the name of it. And I thought, am I going to really take this chance and try to be a historian? Well, I did it. And uh, as time went by, 
I have had some experiences that I think were great fun, were very interesting, and I've met some very interesting people in the years as I have tried to collect materials which documents the history of our state. There is an allure that comes with old letters, for me at least there is, and I suspect many of you share that same feeling, that there's something about picking up a communication from an earlier era, especially if it's manifested in a way uh, that is appealing, such as these really interesting letters uh, in a script that is not modern, but yet is quite readable. When I was growing up, we had at our house my grandmother's trunk, and it was a camelback trunk, very much like this one, although this is not it. And every once in a while, I would get in there and and uh, look around in that trunk, and that's where my grandmother had kept her photographs and her papers. And uh, fortunately, as time went by, I accumulated more and more material out of this trunk, some of which I have to this day, some of which I have given to various museums and so on. So there was that allure that, that got my interest even as a little bitty child. And then, when I was right out of college, I discovered um, the interest of, to me, what was very interesting, and that was going to garage sales and front porch sales and so on, looking for material about Arkansas. Now, I know there are plenty of people in this room who just despise that, and you've been dragged around to garage sales by your spouse against your will and that sort of thing. But I really got into it, and I remember the very first time I found something that was really interesting to me. It was, the, it was a book put out when the USS Arkansas, this particular USS Arkansas, uh, which was uh, launched in 1910, uh, they published a book that went with this. And I found a copy of it on a front porch sale and this would have been in 1969, I think, 1970, and, <clears throat> and it had names written in it, and people had signed various references to them, and so on. It was kind of like a yearbook sort of thing. It was fascinating. And that was the very first item that I purchased uh, dealing with Arkansas history, and ultimately I gave it to the, uh, uh, what is today, the uh, Arkansas Military Museum in MacArthur Park in Little Rock. Book collecting came next, and I have spent my entire life moving hundreds of boxes of books, and almost never ever had them all out at one time. But today, uh, we, Mary and I built a home down in, near Glen Rose, not too far from here, and we put in built-in bookcases, not these, these are earlier bookcases, but uh, I now have all of my books unpacked and on the shelves, and I can actually get two things that I'm looking for. So I have collected, I have uh, several thousand uh, books and pamphlets about the state, although many of them I've given away through the years to institutions which needed them. Also, when I was an undergraduate in college, I got interested in the history of African Americans in Arkansas. Black history was just sort of discovered while I was an undergraduate in the late 1960s. Um, and I was looking around trying to find that little niche that would allow me to do something in Arkansas history that would be original, uh, you know, not just kicking around the same old can that everybody else has looked at, but to make a contribution from a different angle. So I started specializing in black history uh, research in Arkansas and I kept coming across the name of Isaac T. Gellow. And I found just enough, it was hard to find information on him, but I kept finding things. Found out he had been a slave, had been born a slave in Tennessee, and he was brought to Little Rock during the war uh, when Tennessee was occupied. Uh, his owner brought him and some other slaves to Little Rock. And when Little Rock fell in September of 1864, uh, 1863, uh, uh, he was he was freed. He joined the federal army and um, 
uh, he uh, apparently knew how to read and write, and so he became a sergeant real quickly in the United States uh, Army. After the war, uh, Gillum married a local uh, uh, woman, and they proceeded to make a life as freedmen. Uh, imagine what it was like for these people, uh, middle-aged, they'd spent their entire lives in slavery, uh, and all of a sudden they're free, and they have to start life essentially with nothing. Now, some of the former owners did help their slaves get started, but most did not. They were in, the owners were in bad uh, physical, uh, fiscal condition themselves. So anyhow, Isaac T. Gillum had uh, several uh, children. He ran for uh, and got elected to public office. He was in, uh, he was on the Little Rock City Council. He was in the legislature for one term. He was county coroner for one term. Uh, an interesting guy. Um, but I kept having trouble finding information on him. And you know, genealogists refer to running into that brick wall being sort of at the end of your research capability on something. And so I thought, well, you know, I, I really need to speak to a descendant. So I looked in the phone directory, the Little Rock phone book, and there was a listing for Isaac T. Gillum spelled the same way. That's a little bit unusual. Gillum there, it only has the one I. I thought, well, you know, that's worth a call. So I called up and the phone rang and rang and rang. And finally, a quivering little old lady's voice answered and told me that she was Miss Dorothy Gillum and that Isaac T. Gillum had been her grandfather. This was 1972. He had died in 1906. And she said, we just never took the phone out of his name. <laughs> so from 1906 to 1972, the phone was listed under his name. Well, <clears throat> she uh, was a very wonderful person. She invited me over. I went over there one Saturday morning, and uh, she made tea for me, and we talked. She was a retired teacher from Indianapolis. Her father had been a, uh, Isaac T. Gillum's son, uh, had been a, uh, had gone to Yale of all things. Miraculous things happen for these freedmen. It's just remarkable. Anyhow, he got uh, Isaac Gillum's son, uh, Isaac T. Gillum uh, uh, Jr., I guess you'd say, uh, had a bunch of children, and they were all teachers. They contributed immensely to the development of education for black people in Arkansas. Remember, that had to be started from, from uh, ground level. Well, as time went by, I just learned so much about them. Uh, she died while I was away in college, unfortunately, while I was away in uh, graduate school, and uh, they sold her, the papers were sold at a, an estate sale, and I was not there to go buy them. I know some of them were saved. I found out later, I met Isaac T. Gillum IV, who's still living, although he's really quite ancient right now. Isaac T. Gillum IV was from California. He had been a jet pilot during the Korean War, and um, then later he left the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Navy and uh, went to work for NASA. And so the space shuttle program, which was just decommissioned a couple of three years ago, uh, he designed, the, the, he was in charge of the team that put together the space shuttle program for NASA. He, he was in Arkansas, he was in Little Rock where I met him um, to be inducted into the Arkansas Aviation Hall of Fame. Well, I'm gonna move on. I could talk about him all day long, but uh, it was a great, great personal experience for me to get off, to get into local history research by meeting this family and getting to know them quite intimately. When I was working at the uh, University of Central Arkansas in Conway, I kept hearing about a photograph collection, a very good photograph collection at Mountain Home. And so I finally wrangled an invitation from the gentleman 
who had put this collection together, to come up and see it. And so after all the preliminaries, he asked me if I would like to go to his dark room, and I said yes. And so he led me down into this. That is a fallout shelter. That's the only fallout shelter, residential fallout shelter, I've ever been in. They still had all of the stuff that, you know, they stopped back in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, Charles Butcher was an engineer, and he had moved to Mountain Home back in the 40s to build uh, some of the uh, dams that the Corps of Engineers were building up there. And he was an amateur photographer, Charles Butcher. And he got to know an old German in uh, Mountain Home uh, by the name of Arthur Keller. He and his family had immigrated to Mountain Home back in the 18... Uh, uh, 90s and he had been a town photographer his entire life never married uh, sort of reclusive his body wasn't discovered for his body he died in his studios and they didn't find him for days afterwards anyhow his collection of uh, glass negatives he had used glass negatives for most of his career and his collection was thousands of images. And there was a guy in town who told Mr. Keller, uh, uh, who told uh, Mr. Butcher about this collection. And he knew that, uh, that uh, Mr. Butcher had been an amateur photographer and thought that he might be willing. And he also knew about this fallout shelter, a good place to store them. So uh, Mr. Butcher took the collection home, put it in the fallout shelter, and it stayed there from 1964 until about uh, uh, 1995 or so, when I got it for University of Central Arkansas. It is a wonderful collection of images, just, just great stuff. Um, <coughs> this image did not come through properly. It's supposed to have, the second image is the background, is the whole picture of, of the mountain home <coughs> telephone operator <clears throat> and sh that's her dog there his name is Central by the way <coughs> but when this slide came together <clears throat> somehow or other <clears throat> that part of the picture disappeared that's a great photograph of this town uh, phone operator and her pet Nellie Mitchell on the left I knew Nellie Mitchell. I met her during this time. She was ancient. She lived to be about 100. Uh, lived in poverty. Her husband died young. She had all these kids. And uh, here she is as just a young girl. Uh, she was about this tall. She was a tiny little woman. And she was about 100 when I met her. And she had just won $6 million. <laughs> By suing... It wasn't the National Enquirer, but it was in the same, it was the Star or one of those National Enquirer type. They saw a picture of her somewhere, and it was about her 100th birthday and that she was still a newspaper carrier. And she did. She kept carrying newspapers till she died. So that newspaper, that scumbag of a newspaper, published an article and ran a picture of her as a hundred a year old woman who had had a fling with somebody at a nursing home. They, they just, it's all made up. So the next time you see a politician referring to his endorsement by the National Enquirer, uh, just think about Nellie Mitchell here. Um, an unidentified lineman. Thank you, Steve. A July 4th uh, parade and celebration. Mr. Keller photographed the community in many, many settings, and that's what makes this collection so wonderful. There are plenty of portraits, but the portraits do not have the significance of his documentation of everyday life. Here's a blow up of how they decorated the mule's <laughs> harness. I think that's a mule. Looks like a mule to me. 
Lots of photos uh, documenting the history of transportation. That's one of the, at that time, back in the early part of the century, uh, Baxter County up around Mountain Home was just, there were so many ferries up there on the White River and other rivers. Uh, Christmas, several Christmas photographs. I love this one. Uh, this little girl obviously came from a pretty affluent family. Uh, all of those all of those dolls, a, a little dresser-like thing, a tea set, and a wash tub with a ringer. See that ringer right there? I've never seen one. Like that. <laughs> This young girl uh, had doting parents, I suspect. The Keller photographs uh, also document humor in several different ways. Here's a, there was a Baptist uh, college in Mountain Home, and so there are lots of pictures of uh, college-age students and so on, including this girl playing the Kadar who's just getting ready to be surprised and a hayride picture in which they made no effort to hide their Jack Daniels or whatever that is. John R. Hume, the guy in the middle there. Man, this was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. If you are going to be an archivist where you're recruiting collections and there are other archives around competing with you, which in Arkansas is the case, there's the Butler Center, there's the U of A, there's UCA, there's ASU at Jonesboro, uh, Hendricks College at Conway, they collect Methodist stuff. So there's competition between all of these archives to get these collections. And um, so I got the Democrat, I got the Gazette every morning and opened it to the obituary pages. The obituaries are the best friend of an archivist. And there, was an obituary for John R. Hume. I was familiar with Mr. Hume because I had read a series of articles he had done on the history of transportation in Arkansas, but I knew nothing about him other than that. But I recognized the name, so I got on the phone, and this is the problem for an archivist. When is too soon to call and when is too late? Because too late comes very quickly nowadays. The heirs will start pitching stuff before the coffin is lowered into the ground. So there's this challenge for an archivist. You don't want to call up and uh, ask to have the leftovers for somebody who's still wiping their eyes. But on the other hand, you just can't afford to wait. Well, I called this one, and boy, was it a strange obituary. I was trying to identify who to call. And the city had two heirs. One was a niece out in California, and the other one was the strangest relationship I have ever heard in my life. It was step, it was a step second cousin. A step second cousin? Anyhow, I was puzzled by that. I called up and uh, this lady answered, and she said, oh yeah, come on down, we're throwing stuff away left and right, and there's a ton of stuff here, and you better hurry up. And I said, are you aware that it came in 10 inch snow last night? And uh, she said, yes, but we're, we're pitching stuff. So I got in my car and made, made my way over to this residence on Marshall Street in Little Rock. Uh, I don't guess it's possible to turn that light out independently of the other ones, is it? Yes, now it's it turns this whole thing off. Um, well, that'd be all right if it's convenient to do that. Um, so I, anyhow, I went to this house on Marshall Street. That, that's better. I went to this house on Marshall Street and um, imagine it in the aftermath of a very heavy wet snow and it was just there was just snow everywhere it seemed and so I made my way in and upstairs 
is a huge room he had made, Mr. Hume had made into his library. Well, first of all, I got to tell you about the, the, uh, his heirs. I met the uh, woman who was from California and she was very forthcoming. And I said, well, what about this step second cousin or whatever? And she just died laughing. She said, I'm going to just tell you point blank. I'm from California and I speak directly. That's his gay partner. They've been together for 40 years. <laughs> but in 1987, I think it was 87, we didn't say that in the Democrat Gazette, or the Gazette, it was the Gazette at that time. So I said, uh, let's look around until we went up on the second floor and it was just, there was just papers everywhere, maps and all kinds of books and Newspaper articles, just everything, everywhere. And I said, um, why is this stuff all strewn about? And the woman said, well, we, we've been putting them in trash cans and throwing these windows open and throwing them out the windows. So what I thought was head-high piles of snow under shrubs was actually head-high piles of snow under black trash bags full of documents. What happened was that Mr. Hume had been employed in his youth by the Arkansas State Department, by the Arkansas uh, Highway Department, and he had worked his entire career there, spent his entire working life, uh, and they moved several times during that time. And every time they moved, they would throw away their records. They'd put them out on the street. And so Mr. Hume would uh, take them home. And so he had the archives for the Arkansas State Department of Transportation, or the Highway Department at that time. Uh, there's no law allowing them to do that, by the way. They just did it. There's no law that, allow, there's no law that allows for the uh, destruction of county or any kind of re governmental record unless you go through a process of microfilming it or otherwise following a procedure to legitimately and legal deaccession it. Well, anyhow, so I uh, I started going through all of this stuff. We, we It took us days to get it all to, uh, to uh, Conway. Fortunately, we only had one trash bag that uh, had gotten really wet and stuff, and we were able even to save some of that. But it was just a trove of photographs and oh, memoranda and contracts from all over the state of Arkansas, and it came so so close to being thrown away. And later on, I want you to know that the Arkansas Highway Department had the nerve to chew me out for having all of their records at Conway. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to let you back into this archives again. Uh, what did, you know, it, they just threw them away. Anyhow, great photographs of bridges. I think that swinging bridge was the one at Tumbling Shoals, I'm not sure. Well, that sign there does not say where it is, it says that there's a three-ton limit. That uh, suspension bridge collapsed a few years ago. You know, most people don't realize that we had toll uh, roads in Arkansas at one time, at various times in our past. And when they built the bridge at, over the Arkansas River at Russellville in the 1920s, 1930s, um, it was a toll bridge. And this is one of the toll booths. Um, this is on the Russellville, this is on the Dardanelle side of the bridge. You know, the, the bridge connects Russellville on the north side of the river with Dardanelle on the south side of the Arkansas River. Great road construction photographs. The one at the bottom right is, uh, <clears throat> that's from McGee. Uh, no, no, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm thinking the wrong thing. That is a paving project in East, East Arkansas. This is from McGee in the aftermath of the 1927 flood, when many of, their, of the highway department was so happy that they had paved a number of roads in Arkansas during the 20s and then along came the flood in 27 and destroyed many of them. We couldn't afford to have our own roughometer in Arkansas, 
a vehicle which would tell uh, how rough, which would me measure how rough the roads were. So we borrowed the, the roughometer from the Oklahoma Transportation Department, and they made a picture of it. I love it. Well, another family that I came to know, and by the way, you do get to know these families, and in some cases, you get to know them quite well. Uh, my wife and I got to know the lady on the left, who is Mrs. Harold Sherman. In 1987, I again saw an obituary for a person who struck me as being the kind of person who ought to have some papers. He had, it said in the obituary that he had written all these books and so I called up there and uh, spoke to their, uh, one of their two daughters, and she invited me up. And uh, he was already dead, so I never met him, but uh, Mrs. Uh, Sherman was just a grand, grand person. I think that Mrs. Harold Sherman was the most beautiful person I have ever seen in my life based upon the pictures from her youth in the 1920s. Uh, well, actually, even before the 1920s. <clears throat> she was absolutely striking, and there are tons of photographs. And they wrote love letters to each other their entire lives. I mean, it's just, it's just an, a, a miraculous story. This is their little home south of Mountain View. I was talking about Mountain Home a few minutes ago. You know, that's up further north, right on the border with Missouri. Uh, <clears throat> Mountain View is further south in Stone County, <coughs> a much smaller town and a much poorer uh, community. Well, this is the little house that they bought. <clears throat> they were living in Los Angeles where uh, Harold Sherman had been writing scripts for, he worked for the movie houses out there, um, and he wrote scripts for movies, edited scripts, revised scripts, did all kinds of stuff. Harold Sherman had never worked a day in his life for a salary. He worked basically by turning out manuscripts. He was paid for the writing job. His daughter told me that when they were young, if they needed a car, he'd write a book. He wrote dozens and dozens of books. This was the smokehouse out back where I found a film that he did. I'll be talking with you about in just a little bit. But he, his bread and butter for many, many years was what was called uh, uh, Young Boys. Mountain View had been fortunate to get electricity a few years earlier before the arrival of the Shermans. The Shermans moved to Mountain View in 1948. They were driving from Los Angeles to Chicago where they had family, and Harold felt all of a sudden that he was possessed by spirit and that he needed to go where the spirit was leading him. And so they ended up in Mountain View, Arkansas. So that particular spirit uh, was from the Ozarks. And so they found this little little bitty cabin. It was just a tiny little thing. And these are sophisticated people. I mean, these are people who were educated, well-read. And they moved into that place. Uh, no electricity, no running water. And they lived there for several years. He's probably the only man in Arkansas who, when they got a bathroom inside and they burned the outhouse. He wrote an ode to the outhouse. <laughs> well, if you look at this picture here, you'll see one of the most powerful men in the state of Arkansas. That's C. Hamilton Moses. He took over um, the Arkansas Power and Light Company uh, when uh, Harvey Couch passed on. And uh, Harold Sherman, whom you see there in the lower picture on the right with the tie, oh, the locals up in Mountain, up in Stone County, thought he was just bonkers wearing white shirts during the week. They just could not get over that. And 
apparently talked with him about it. Asked him if he didn't have any work shirts. <laughs> there you'll notice that C. Hamilton Moses is cradling something in his arm. What is that? That is a young pig which that farmer has brought to Hamilton Moses as a token of appreciation for getting electricity on his farm. They lived on, the, the Shermans lived on the mail route called the Cahokia Mail Route. It was a little bitty, tiny little crossroads. And then there was another nearby town named Ben. So they made an electric light with the names Cahokia Ben on it had a great party, great <coughs> celebration, and of course took tons of pictures. Harold Sherman was a promoter. Remember I said earlier that he was, he really knew how to promote things. And if you'll remember in the late 50s, uh, Lassie was a very popular television show. And there were other popular dog shows on television too, Rin Tin Tin and others. Um, so Harold Sherman came up with the notion of having a dog a series on television set in Stone County. And he put together this pilot called My Dog Sheppy. Um, it was one, uh, one pilot, never got beyond the pilot stage because it was the worst single pilot ever made, I'm sure, it's just horrible. But it's not, it, it didn't have to be that way. They just, I think they got some bad people out of Los Angeles. But they, for example, uh, there in the lower picture you see the uh, mother and father of a lost little girl who's wandering around somewhere nearby. They've been camping. The little girl's gotten lost. Anyhow, they're talking to uh, a man who owns a, a store there in Mountain View. Does he look familiar to you? Hmm? That's Jimmy Driftwood right there. Now, if you had Jimmy Driftwood in a movie, he was. remember how popular he was at that time? Wouldn't you give him an opportunity to sing something? No, that, that made too much sense. But anyhow, Orville Faubus got behind this. And uh, you see him there in the governor's conference room with Sheppy shaking his hand and with the heroine of this little pilot. And uh, the little girl who is lost, who was a, uh, from Little Rock, uh, she was being stalked by, and, and this just gives you, this just shows you how far out of touch Harold Sherman was with the the natural history of the Ozarks. He had that little girl being stalked by a bobcat. And they were all so concerned because of this bobcat. Well, the woman with the bow there is America's, uh, her name was Marston. She was a very well-known archer. I am sorry to tell you that Orville Faubus ordered the Game and Fish Commission to cooperate with them they trapped nine bobcats to use in the film. They killed every one of them during the shooting of that picture. On screen, you see the whole thing happen, and they wonder why the pilot was not picked up by CBS. But anyhow, it's an interesting look at North Arkansas in the late 1950s when it was on the cusp of great and immense change. Um, you know, Sherman's almost totally unknown in Arkansas, but in certain circles he's really well known. In recent years, after his, uh, after his death, five thick volumes of his writings have been put out, have been published. I also learned about, when I was at UCA, I learned about a, uh, how's the time? When do I need to stop? It's, it's 15 minutes till 8. I'll stop at 8. And if you want to, uh, if you want me to stop sooner, just yell. I have to go to Fayetteville tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching two classes up there tomorrow. Um, I heard about a guy named Ray Rains who was a, um, 
who lived over in uh, Pangburn, Arkansas, near Searcy. And he had collected photographs. Uh, he had been a carpenter, but he had cut off one of his hands uh, in, a, in a carpentry accident. And so he became a photographer and set up a studio. And uh, on the weekends, he would take his big camera out and he and his wife would travel around and they'd visit with people and they'd make copies of old photographs. And he accumulated several hundred of these wonderful images. The one on the top there is a saloon in um, Searcy, White County, Arkansas, home of Harding College. I can guarantee you that saloon is not there today. The lower picture is of a uh, hanging that came out of the uh, elephant uh, train robbery uh, of the uh, late 1890s uh, near Newport, Arkansas. By this point, by the time this hanging took place, Arkansas had passed a law to prohibit crowds at hangings. Uh, they had become so huge, so raucous, that, and, and unseemly. I mean, it's bad when the state legislature thinks something is unseemly, but they did, and they passed a law that there could only be 25 people to see it. And so, uh, uh, after that, I guess uh, more and more photographers showed up. And they made uh, they made uh, postcards and sold them for a nickel apiece. That's how we have pictures of why we have pictures of a lot of these hangings is because they were. Uh, done for entrepreneurial purposes. Another photograph collection which I was able to get and which I was so pleased to get was from Julian Pretty in North Little Rock. He had just died and I, his son, uh, Norman Pretty, uh, allowed me through, a, I found out about it through a mutual friend and, and he gave me that collection. His uh, father uh, rented a and did some aerial photography in Little Rock in the early 1920s. Um, and this is an example of that. I love the... Uh, this picture illustrates that the state capitol was not laid out properly. The state capitol was supposed to be laid out so that the doors in front face right on to Capitol Avenue, 5th Street. But they don't. Uh, because it got... When they laid it out, they didn't get it square on. So as a result, the sidewalks leading up to the Capitol <laughs> adjust for the error. Now, er, uh, every archivist has something that he or she wants so badly to collect, and it just never seems to happen. You identify these collections, uh, and you try to recruit them. And it just sometimes it just goes on and on and on. Sometimes it never happens. There's an exhibit in Little Rock today, as a matter of fact, just opened up recently, of pictures made at the Japanese relocation centers in Arkansas during the war. It's a great exhibit. And that was photographed in detail on numerous occasions by a man at Hendricks College named Ferris. And I tried so hard to get Mr. Ferris's photographs from his widow. And she said, well, I have a granddaughter. She's sort of interested in photography. I think I'll give them to her. <coughs> oh, I just wanted to wring her neck. You don't give things like that to a grandchild who might have an interest in them. These are treasures. <laughs> well, I never got them. But the family has allowed them to be copied, and uh, so they're in the historical record now. Well, this is a collection that I tried to get for years and years and years and finally succeeded. And there I am on the happy occasion in which they turned them over to me. These are the papers of the Whittington family uh, from uh, <coughs> Massachusetts, Little Rock, Hot Springs. This is a picture of Hiram Whittington on the right and his brother Granville Whittington on the left. Uh, they were a family from uh, the Boston area. Uh, Granville was trained as a bookbinder. I'm not quite sure what Hiram's training was in. But Hiram came to Arkansas 
and is going to try to make his living here. You know, the frontier, it attracts people who are just getting started and who have the gumption to go there and make, make a living from scratch. And Hiram A. Whittington was one of them. But he wrote home a lot. It was a very close family, well-educated, very literate, and the letters are so descriptive. Now, the Whittington letters have been published, uh, but the originals kept bouncing around from one place to the next. They sat on open library shelving at the, at the public library in Mount Ida for a long, long time. I was really scared they would be stolen. Um, then they sat in a military locker, you know, like we used to see all the time, uh, in a shop, in, a, in his workshop. Uh, but finally, I was able through some different people to get a hold of them. And here's what we were able to add to the historical record. Here's a letter that Hiram is writing in, 19, in 1829. Uh, Arkansas has only been a territory for a short period of time. He, he's writing about Little Rock. The town, and I believe the whole territory, is inhabited by the dregs of Kentucky, Georgia, and Louisiana, and a more drunken, good-for-nothing set of fellows never got together. The Secretary of the Territory and the judges of the Supreme Court drink whiskey out of the same cup and with the lowest born and roll around in the same gutter. There has been, there's a lot of Puritanism in the Whittington family, as you can well imagine. Um, they're the greatest drunkards and they fill the most responsible offices. The, uh, he says an election is coming up. The opposing candidates never meet in the street without stopping to blackguard each other, which means criticize each other, and they very often fight. Most of the inhabitants carry dirks or pistols in their pockets, but the greater part of them are too cowardly to use them. Mr. Woodruff, my employer, the man who had started the Gazette, Mr. Woodruff, my employer, being an honest and sober man, of course, he's another straight-laced guy from the Northeast. The majority of the people are his bitter enemies, and he has frequently been threatened. That is true. William E. Woodruff was, he was even shot at on one occasion. He goes on to say, the bushes in the woods around here, and also in town, are covered with ticks, which are the greatest curse I have yet discovered. I sometimes go into the woods walking, and when I get home, I am obliged to strip and pick the ticks off. They are worse than bed bugs, and in a very short time get under the skin and make a very sore, bad sore. If the girls feel a tick biting them at a party, and even if they are on the floor dancing, they immediately stop and unpin and scratch themselves until they find it. It would do your heart good to see how expert they are at catching ticks. <laughs> this is a good country for peaches, melons, and sweet potatoes. He could transition quickly from ticks to fruit. And that's just one letter? That was out of one letter. That was just a little portion of one letter. They wrote long, long letters to each other. There are about, uh, in August of 1828, he took uh, a steamboat up the Arkansas River to what is today Russellville, where there was a mission for the in, for the Cherokee Indians, Dwight Mission. Some of you will have heard of that. So in <coughs> so in August of 1828, he writes, and notice what he starts with, dear brother. There are about 30 or 40 girls that belong to this school from 5 to 20 years of age. Some can talk as good English as I can. That's the uh, Cherokee girls he's writing about. And some of them a good deal better. 
All that have been in the school one year can talk some English. Some of them have light hair and as white skins as any girls in, in Cohasset. That's the little community near Boston where they live. There are a great many uh, white men married to Cherokee girls and settled in the nation, meaning the Cherokee nation. Most of the girls who receive their education here marry white men and generally make the most affectionate and industrious kind of wives. There are about as many boys as girls who go to school here. The missionaries chose a very good place to locate them. It is on Illinois Creek, what we today call Illinois Bayou, um, about the center of the nation. They have here 30 buildings of one kind or another, a dining room about 100 feet in length, where all the scholars, amounting to from 60 to 70, and everyone attached to the mission, as well as visitors, are drawn together and dine. I'm going to quote from one more letter before we leave the Whittington Papers. He, uh, he's in Little Rock in 18, this is December, just before Christmas, 1830. He's in Little Rock and uh, he's talking about the Bachman family from down near Arkadelphia. The Bachman family is one of the most important historical early, early, early arrivals in Arkansas. And uh, Jacob Bartman is well known to Arkansas history. Uh, let me see here. He describes him, uh, describes, uh, he lives in a fine brick house, probably the best in the territory, has a farm of about 5,000 acres. He didn't know how big his farm was. It was probably more like 500 acres. With several salt springs on it. Salt springs. Very important because you made money from salt springs. Salt was expensive, and so uh, it had to be imported. It was heavy to transport. So if you had a salt spring on your land, you could make a lot of money from it. And if you go to Arkadelphia today, you will see one of the, pot, one of the, boil, uh, the pots that they boil the water out. It's a cauldron as wide as these two tables pushed together, a circular cauldron that they and they would have 50 or 60 of those going at one time at these uh, salt making uh, places. So anyhow, Mr. Bachman has gotten there early and that means he could get the salt springs and that was very, very important. Uh, he makes about 5,000 bushels of salt per annum and with a large number of horses, hogs, cows and so forth, forth and between 40 and 50 slaves besides $9,000 in the bank in New Orleans. There were no banks in Arkansas, believe me. And there wouldn't be any banks in Arkansas for a time yet. Um, but I want to read here how he describes Mrs. Bachman. He goes over all of that stuff, all of his land and his crops and his mules and his uh, 40 or 50 slaves. And he says, I believe... These, I believe, are about all of his good qualities. His wife is a woman about 50, weighing along in the latitude of 200 pounds. She is ill-bred, or rather not bred at all, smokes a dirty pipe, talks all manner of nonsense, which is a euphemism for using profanity, and never had a bonnet on her head in her life. Respectable women went out, wore bonnets. But when she comes to town to see her baby, that's her daughter going to school in Little Rock. There were no schools other than in Little Rock at that time. When she comes to town to see her baby, she has a handkerchief tied around her head and a bearskin shawl over her shoulders. And what is worse than all the rest, she has a very awkward way of boxing her husband's ears. boxing her husband's ears when he displeases her. He is small, weakly, and he bears it very patiently as a good and loving husband is duty bound to do. <laughs> there are two boys, 12 and 14, which with the daughter already mentioned comprise the whole family. Well, that gives you a look at one of the collections that I uh, was able to get. And it really made me happy to get it. 
There's an example of one of the letters. And Granville, I mentioned to you, was a book, professional bookbinder, and he bound the letters. And, uh, you know, luck. Luck is the handmaiden of the historian. Luck plays a huge role in what is preserved. These letters got bound, and that was not luck. That was just good stewardship. But it's somewhere along the line, means many generations of Whittington's lived in this house over at Mount Ida. And it, the, the book got up in the attic, and then the attic got closed off, and it was essentially gone. But when they tore the building down many years later, they found the letters in what had been the attic, and so they were preserved. I'm not going to get into Florence Price because it would take quite a bit of time, and I think we've been here long enough. Thank you for your patience. It was fun. Yes, ma'am. Um, you, you talked about Martha Sherman's beauty and that they were in Los Angeles. Was she an aspiring actress? No, no, no uh, she was not. Um, she was so dedicated, Martha was so dedicated to uh, her husband and to the family. Uh, but she was a really bright, capable woman, and those eyes of hers, my wife met her. We spent the weekend up there with her. Wouldn't you agree with me that Martha Sherman was just an extraordinarily, even in her, I don't know how she was at the time, 80s perhaps, maybe 90s, she was still striking. Sir? Uh, I'm just curious, is an effort being made to digitize all those photographs? Uh, the question is, has an effort been made to digitize all the photographs? Um, there are so many, uh, yes, many of the thing, many of the photographs I've collected through the years have been digitized. It would be practically impossible and not even good, though, to d digitize all of them because archival institutions and libraries are filled with millions of things that need to be digitized. It's very expensive. It's a very slow process. You all have done it here. Uh, if you get a collection of, say, 10,000 photographs, you're going to have to drop some money in order to process all those. So a lot of collections are not digitized down to the last image, but yes, there are many of them. Uh, many of them have di been digitized, and uh, I didn't include in this discussion uh, uh, Mr. Charles Dove from here in, from here in Benton. Uh, I found out about Mr. Dove from a friend of mine uh, who was a friend of his and said that uh, he'd gotten was getting older and was worried about his photographs. And so he gave them uh, to me and they are at uh, UCA today. Uh, a number of those have been digitized. Uh, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them have been. If you go to the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, you, you'll find online uh, many of the photographs that I collected <coughs> when I was there and um, a number of them that were collected when I was at um, Fayetteville are also online. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Where is Mr. Whittington buried at? Where is Mr. Whittington buried? Uh, Hiram lived in Hot Springs. And Whittington Avenue in Hot Springs is named for him. Uh, he did... Oh, I'm feeling the urge to give you a lecture about something. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I promise I'm not going to do it. Anyhow, uh, Hiram Whittington got into... He was the first man to really do whetstones in a big way. And uh, so he lived uh, in Hot Springs and is buried there. Granville Whittington is buried in a cemetery near Mount Ida, the Whittington Family Cemetery. Uh, in Montgomery County. Thank you again. <laughs>